My name is Aidan McCullen. I am the host of The Innovation Show and the author of Undisruptible, A Mindset of Permanent Reinvention for Organizations, Individuals and Life. On today's episode, we're going to talk about so many things, including the power in the pain, the pain of disruption, the pain of transformation, how I looked into that pain to see what were some hints for the future, how I reinvented myself from being a very poor athlete, last picked on the playground, into being visible from being that invisible kid, and then how to reinvent myself after my career in professional rugby into the real world as a consultant, as a lecturer, as an author, and more. We're also going to talk about no matter where you are in an organization, you can lead. You don't need to wait for direction. You can do small things, small initiatives, where you can create small successes. When you have a success, it's easier to sell success than it is to sell an idea throughout the organization. People will take notice. We're also going to talk about how to be undisruptible in an organization when the organization becomes less intelligent. When the organization goes to crisis mode, it's going to be thinking all over the place, not very clearly. You can be the one who has built capability before you need it in order to be undisruptible. We're gonna talk about so much more. Stay tuned for another great episode with Dov Barron. Welcome back to part two of our delicious conversation with Aidan McCullen. He's the best-selling author of Undisruptible, a mindset of permanent reinvention for individuals, organizations, and life. He is also the founder and host of The Innovation Show, and he is a change consultant, executive coach, uh, ex-professional uh, rugby player who reinvented himself in order to make a huge difference and is doing so. He now actually um, teaches modules at, at uh, Trinity College Business School, which is ranked number one in Europe. Uh, Aiden is coming to us from Ireland. And um, we've been talking a lot about what reinvention means And how to actually be undisruptible, because we love to cling to what's familiar. And that makes us very, it makes us fragile. It makes us completely disruptible. So we talked about the importance of pain. And, you know, the interesting thing about pain, I've talked about this many times on the show before, is pain is an incredibly powerful transformation agent. The only difference is the tolerance of pain. How much pain do you need in order to change? (laughs) If you're an idiot like me, maybe you need to fall off a mountain and get smashed to pieces. Uh, If you're a smart person, maybe you just need to twist your ankle a little bit. And maybe that twisting of the ankle is a psychological twist. It's a a realization of a a discussion with somebody in the work environment. You realize this is not the place for me. How much pain do you need? So we talked about the importance of pain. We talked about um, how uh, the brain gets stupid under under stress. Under stress, we become 27% not as bright. The blood flow to the prefrontal cortex of the brain is cut off. And whether that's as an individual, whether that's as a collective, as an organization, we're not going to do particularly well. And that we need to constantly reinvent, uh, reinvent ourselves. Uh, Aiden talked about the need to build capabilities before you need them. And we talked about what reinvention really is. And yes, there's this idea of being the phoenix who willingly walks into the fire in order to transform itself. But, you know, Aiden laid out a beautiful metaphor that I'm sure you've heard a million times before, which is the caterpillar to the butterfly. But in a way that you probably never thought about it before, in a way that if you didn't hear it, if you did, if you miss part one of the show, go back. There's a ton of great value in there. And particularly in understanding this process of what genuine transformation actually is, but more important, how you are going to face your internal and external resistance to the changes that need to take place. So we're going to jump back in here. We're going to talk more with Aiden about his book, Indis- Indisruptible. And in order to do that, let, let's come to this, this place of you are you, the listener, the viewer, are 
in an environment, you know, maybe that's where you're working, you're in an environment where there is a resistance to change. You know you've got to change, yet your position seems pretty safe. I don't know there's such a thing anymore, but your position seems pretty safe, but you can see that the the organization is a little rigid. It's not moving as, as fast as it should. It's not getting ahead of that curve. It's not building the capabilities before it needs it. What do you do? Guide us, Aiden. What, 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 what does that person do? They can feel the impetus, but they can see that they're in an environment where that's being ignored. What would you say to that, that C-suite leader? So firstly, the question comes, uh, can you make the change as in the, the oftentimes a lot of leadership C suites, so so that the executive team of an organization knows there's a change needed, but it gets blocked further down the organization. So mm -hmm. middle management play a huge role because they allocate resources. So yeah. they can nod to you and go, Yeah, sure, that's a great idea. But then they can actually block it both by what they do, and more importantly, what they don't do. And yes. we often miss that. And C-suite execs think things are happening, they don't happen. A great case study of this comes from a company called Sonosite. And the late, great Clayton, Clayton Christensen talked about this, where he he's the father of this term, disruptive innovation, disruptive technology, etc. And he talked about Sonosite, which were this company and this was close to my heart, Dov, from the Ruby days, <laughs> was they created uh, uh, ultrasound. So yep. the whole idea of being able to uh, scan a player and, you know, look and see if there's any tears inside the muscles. And in the in the, the previous sized version of their machines were huge. So they were the size of a big TV, a big 42 inch screen TV. Yeah. And the CEO said, we need to cannibalize ourselves here because somebody else is going to do it. So we introduced this smaller one, which was about the size of a laptop. Mm -hmm. Now, he could not understand why when he told customers about this, they were all so excited. They were like, that means it's brilliant. It's portable. It's, it's mobile. I can bring it everywhere. But it wasn't selling. So we asked one of his sales teams, his top sales guys, can I come out on the sales call with you? Mm -hmm. He sat there. And he watched the guy doing his magic, one of the top sales guys. And he saw that the guy would not take out the new product. And he, he said, he, he interrupted him in front of the client and said, show him the new product. And the guy ignores him. Hmm. He does it again a second time. The guy ignores him. And he wasn't being disrespectful to his boss. But the boss asked him afterwards, he's like, what? Why didn't you show him the new product? And he's like, "Gone. What's my, what's my job for the company?" And he's like, "To make money." And he goes, "I got to sell five of those, in or one of those. It's right. way easier to sell one. I'm doing my job." And what it shows is the guy was putting his resources, his he was allocating his resources towards what he thought was best for the company. So there was a communication error. The, right. the C-suite. We're saying one thing, but all the rewards and recognition and remuneration were pointing towards different things. And that lets down so many companies. They get mixed in the middle there and they miss actually what is the incentives saying to people versus what we're saying about disruption and change. So that's somewhere that many, many people get caught out. The other one then, just to say, if you, if you don't have the leadership team on board, you're really up against it. Because mm -hmm. if the head like the caterpillars head doesn't change, then the organization doesn't change. And it's very, very difficult to change it from the bottom or from the middle. Right. But I think, you know, that first part that you said that is such a really great point is are we as in the organization providing the resources uh, and the context, which is also important, the context to the change. Because I think that oftentimes, uh, you know this, because you and I are consultants, we go into companies and we, we've heard this. I'm, I'm sure you've heard it. I, I've heard it a thousand times, which is, oh, shit, here we go again. It's a change for the sake of change. 
right? Oh yeah. You know, this is the flavor of the month of, you know, but you know, cause I, I, I sneak people off. <laughs> it was like, you know, what do you really think about this? And they're like, you know, it's flavor of the month, man. And I go, what do you mean? And they go, Oh, you know, there'll be somebody else here in three months or six months with a new system and a new thing. And we got to learn that. And we're supposed to embrace that. And it's, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I can totally see that because you know, when we talk about engagement, we have to talk about engagement, not just of the individual, but engagement of the idea, engagement of the innovation, engagement of the reinvention. And that's a very, very important piece that you've brought up here because, you know, they reinvented the screen and, and the laptop size and the portability, and this is going to be great. But they never recontextualized it for people to see the people who had to go out in the workforce into the sales force rather and sell it. And so that's such a great way of understanding this. So the question then would be, I, I'm guessing, I'm asking you, um, are we asking the right questions? Are we, are we giving the right context? What don't you know, Charlie, Susan, Betty, whoever you are, as you go out into, into the world, carrying this new idea, this reinvention, this re reimagining of us, what's missing for you, right? Because until that guy sat there with them, he didn't know. That, that's, that's fascinating. So if I'm in the, if I'm in a middle management position, what do I do about that? Well, from a from a middle manager position, I think, like you do this really well, I was complimenting you for this, that you signpost and you contextualize the guest for your audience on, a, on an ongoing basis. And bring that then to the executive suite. So you know, oftentimes, that the, the, the top layer of an organization gets treated amazingly well gets sent off to Harvard, MIT, INSEAD in Europe, whatever it might be, gets treated really well. They get updated in their mental models on a regular basis. They get to see case studies of disruption, et cetera, et cetera. But the middle manager in the company doesn't get that. They're operational. They're getting people to do what they're told from above. And without knowing why, and without understanding the speed of change, the stuff we talk about on a regular basis, and we, we need to be careful of that also as consultants, because we love this stuff, we absolutely yeah. love it. But oftentimes, a lot of the people we're talking to don't. And that's why I try to find metaphor, and useful stories to be able to connect with people because they go, Ah, is that all it is? And organizations don't do enough of that. And, you know, because you're, you're great at this with your own writing and, and work is being a good storyteller and, and CEOs would often ask me, why is there all these courses and storytelling books and storytelling? Because you are the chief storyteller. Yes. You are the CSO, not the CEO, chief storyteller officer. You got to be constantly telling stories ad nauseum and ad nauseum means until you are sick, until you are blue in the face, because you can be damn sure that yes, you at the C-suite are very clear on the vision and the direction and the strategy. But as you go down the organization and the elevator, you can find those people at the entry level have no clue what you're doing, or mm -hmm. they don't know why. And I'll bring this back to one of the things Dov did at the end of my sports career was I coached because I had to, when you're talking about building capability before you need it. So you're, you're a professional rugby player, you're well paid, all of a sudden, you're an intern. And I had to find a, a couple of sources of income to be able to tolerate that period of being an intern. So mm -hmm. I, I worked also as a coach. So it was a player coach for a rugby team. And one of the th problems that team had it is the guys wouldn't do weights and they wouldn't do any of that type of work. So I was trying to get, figure out what's going on here. And they had for some reason in their heads that they didn't need to. Mm. So I, I one day brought out all the got the guys to bring out all the weights onto the rugby pitch. And then I went, Okay, john, show me how you break a tackle. And john shows me how to break a tackle. And I go, Okay, here's an exercise. This is called a clean look at the clean look at the exact same movement as breaking a tackle 
And then mm. I was like, to the next guy, he's like, look, show me how you, ja it's called jackling, where you compete for the ball on the ground, jackle for the ball, he jackles for the ball. And I go, now, Mike, show me what a deadlift looks like. He does a deadlift. And you could just see this realization of kind of going, ah. And after that, I couldn't get them out of the gym. In fact, right. they got injured <laughs> from being in the gym too much as right. a result. But, but it's just, it's connecting the dots between what are you doing and why and purpose and I know purpose and, and, and North stars and, and reasons why are so important in your work as well, mm -hmm. but they are everything to people in an organization. If you feel like a cog in a wheel, then that's the kind of output you'll get from people that you'll get a mechanistic output from people if they feel like a piece of machinery. Yeah. And, and moreover, I mean, since the, since the COVID pandemic, et cetera, uh, you know, we've got the great resignation, we've got quiet quitting, we've got all these phenomena. And what we actually have to recognize is that, you know, I've spoken about how this is the great pause. And it's allowed people to stop and go, why the hell am I doing this thing? Um, and if they don't feel like there's purpose and meaning in what they're doing, why would they stay with you? That, well, the answer is they'll pay the rent. Okay. But why would they stay beyond that? Because then you've got the people who, who literally resi got resigned and walked away. And then you had the ones who said, well, I got to stay, I got to pay the rent. And they became quiet quitters. Well, what is quiet quitting? It means it's total disengagement. I am going to do what I need to do and nothing more. And so how does, let's talk about it from your point of view, from this point of view of reinvention. How do we engage our people in an environment that is having to reinvent everything? So I think that the first is finding a, a why. And, and, you know, the, the why thing can be, can be over talked about too much, but not contextualized in that, like, some people just, just want to do the work, and they just want to go home, they don't care about the bigger why everybody has an individual why so the why yeah. could be, you know what, I, I'm a single mother, I want to pay, be able to pay for my kid to be able to go to a college. That's mm -hmm. a, that's an amazing why. So sure. I'm a big fan of asking people individually, what what's your what's your reason for this? What's your reason? Because you kind of go, Oh, I want to, you know, um, be the most customer centric company in the world. That means nothing to Aiden in sector seven G. He's like, exactly. oh, like, I just want to pay my bills, man, you know? Yeah. So I think my, mining that on an individual level as a kind of a, a cascade throughout an organization where each, each boss does that with each team is important, but then you need this overarching, meaningful and, and very importantly, authentic why mm -hmm. for a company so you know you think of someone like amazon and, and you know one of the missions is to be the world's most uh, customer centric company or you think of google and to, to organize the world's information they they are th that's that's great for a strategic decision to go will i will i make this strategic decision you compare it against the straw man of well does it help the world's information be more organized you kind of go yes but it doesn't drive me on a, on an individual level no. so i think that 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 work is so important and it's very rarely done like you know man it, you know people have all these words on walls but they don't mean anything and to do that work and, and there's something you said that's really important as well is that somebody down at the lower echelons of, of an organization often have gold of information, but they're not consulted, they're not spoken to, they're not mined for information. And the late Andy Grove, who was the CEO of Intel, he had a beautiful saying, he said, when the spring first appears, the snow starts to melt first at the edges. And mm -hmm. what he was talking about is that the edges of your organizations, the interface between you and the outside world, your customer, your suppliers, etc. There's information there. And change starts to happen there first, your first customers who don't book with you anymore start to go with a new product. And you got to listen to that. And if there's no means from there, those people to be able to communicate up to the people who are making strategic decisions, you're in real trouble. And then to say what you said, 
if they've quietly quit, they don't give a rat's ass. Exactly. They're not going to give you any information because they don't care because you've exactly. treated them like a machine all their life. You, they're only staying with you to pay the pay the bills. So why would they care if your organization uh, survives the next disruption? They'll just go to a different company. Yeah, and and if you and if you've bought into the if you're a worker who's bought into the idea they don't give a shit about me, uh, I'm just a cog in the machine, then I can be a cog in any machine. So yeah, I may walk away from you guys, or you may can me, but you know there's a shortage of workers uh, who can do what I do. I have a skill to do. I can go do the mechanics of it anywhere, but to get my heart to get my soul, to get real, whole me, complete me to show up, that's going to take a considerable amount more. And, and, you know, you, you hit on something that I am fierce about, and that is mining subjective purpose. Like, why are you doing this? Why, what matters most to you in your life? And the, the, the pushback is obviously the same. We don't have time for that. How do you confront that with a company who you can see, you know, you're brought in, you see this company, you're a consultant, you're, you're an expert in change, and you're brought in and you said, you know, we need to deal with this. We've got all this change going on, Aiden. Um, and there's so much disruption, so many things going on. We don't have time to mine this subjective meaning for individuals to find out there what what drives them we just got to you know we got to stop the ship going down how do you deal and confront with that so that this is man this is the worst part isn't it this the hardest part of our jobs is where sometimes it's it, it's called excuse the term it's an ugly term but lipstick on a pig you know yeah. you're brought in there just to you know, tick the box and go to the board. They're saying to the board, oh, yeah, we brought in an innovation guy and yeah, he did some work. Great. We're, we're more innovative now. Tick. And and the meaningful work is way harder to come across. It's, it's true about this profession. But one of the things I've found really useful, and it's why I do exec coaching and the work with, with teams, because if I can get to the head and think back to what you said in part one about the caterpillar, caterpillar head, yeah. if I can get to the head, which is often a senior exec and start to show them the difference and do it through work on their personal purpose, their, you know, personal values, etc. You can see the change in them because you start to influence the change. And then you go, and I'm doing this with a, a, a CEO at the moment, actually. And he he's mentioned how he, I, I asked him about risks in his company. He goes, one of these guys is a risk or flight risk. He might leave the organization. And I go, what are you going to do? And he goes, I'm going to offer him more money. And I go, why, why don't you do this? Why don't you ask him what he wants in the next three years? And he goes, oh, why would I, why would I do that? And I was going to go, well, it's the same as me asking you. So you become kind of a mentor. And you go, look. What do you want to achieve in the next three years? And then say to him, he'll tell you. And then you go, I want to help you do that. And I want to help you do it with me in this company where you can forget about, you know, your basic need, needs, like your salary, etc. But what do you want to achieve, man? And, and I'll help you do that. And he had the conversation. He said it just was a transformative okay. conversation versus what do you want? Like, because that, that's, me, that's mechanistic, that's mechanical versus humanistic, which is what do you, the person behind the mask, the persona, what do you want and how can I help you do that? That's, a, that's such a simple change on the outside, but it, it absolutely changes relationships on the inside. It's unbelievable how that, that can change things. So, I, I, Dov, to answer your question, try to get to the real decision makers, really try to make a difference in them, whether it's a workshop or one on one coaching, and then try and convince them to bring it across the organization and say to them, I'm not looking for more work. here. <laughs> I have enough work. But this actually does work. And if you create a cascade of mentors, even across an organization from the people who are there converted, I call it uh, reverse vampires, 
positive vampires right. who go and spread the positivity across an organization, you can really change things. I think that's a really great point. Um, be, and so when we're confronted with this idea, we don't have time um, to do that. Um, or, you know, oftentimes I'll, I'll meet somebody who is, I, I, I don't tend to work with middle management, mine are more in the executive suite, but if I meet somebody in that space um, or who's dealing with that space, who says to me, you know, I, I just can't get, the 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 friction i can't get the the grasp that i need to in order to do this um in order to get the company to do this and i say what the hell are you waiting for and they go what do you mean i say you're waiting for permission don't ask for permission they go what do you mean i go how many people are you leading when they go well i have six people on my team great go do it with your people but do it with yourself first get a sense of it you're not going to be an expert at it but you're going to get a sense of it and you can give that sense to them, and then you can find and that because the idea is what we have to understand, and you and I love talking about epigenetics and, and how that works. Right. So what you have to understand, you're a you're you're a cluster of cells that is your part of the organization inside this body, which is the organization itself. And you can't get directly to the brain or to the heart yourself. Okay. Okay, they're not gonna allow you access. All right. Can you change this cluster? Because if you can't, it will, it will um, turn into some cancerous thing that will start eating you and the, and the machine away. So can you start saying, well, what is it that drives me? And what is it that drives you, Charlie, and you, Susan, and you, you know, you put it, the people inside of your group? Because then you start to stand out and then people say, what the hell's going on with Aiden's group? They're really functioning high. Well, let's have a word with him. Bring him in. Well, what happened? Well, listen, you know, I worked with Dov Barron or I read Aiden's book or I did this or I worked with Aiden or or I took the Aiden's course, whatever it was. And I started to examine what is my purpose in life? Why? Do, why? Do, what's my meaning? And I took that to my team. I, I, I actually gave everybody the homework of reading this book or reading this chapter. And then we talked about it. And yes, you know what? We did it in our own time. We did it in lunch and we, we took that time to do it. But as a result, we're all we're more engaged with each other. And by the way, we also now have a, a group thing where we get together and we hang out. And oh, really? Yeah, that's why. We're, oh, well, we maybe should do it in the company. You think? You think? <laughs> so sometimes you, if you don't have the power to make the change, sometimes you have to decide to be the example that makes the change. Because Probably. if you are that example and you really bring it together, you make such a massive ripple that the bigger boats are still going to get – like, where did that come from? They're still going to recognize there was, there was, as you said, a crest. There was a crest in the water that lifted things up and like, what happened? I don't see anything. What happened? Let's start making some inquiries. So I think it's a really good point you're making, like that need to mine – and do the thing at a cellular level. And just can I add as well the the, the I love that be the change you want to see is yeah. is a great way to think about that. But then also it's easier to sell a success than it is to sell an idea. That's Very a concept good. from the book I'm I'm working on at the moment is that if you can point to some some little sliver of success and go here's this tiny little project I was working on, or here's the output of my team doing a brown bag lunch every month and bringing in a speaker, or watching a podcast, or we start to all read this book and meet and then discuss it afterwards. Like there's loads of stuff you can do that are low level, low lying fruit, and then point and kind of go, look, as a result, I haven't lost anybody. Nobody's left my department. In fact, other people want to clamor to get into the department. And then I call it again from that book, I call it the curtain twitcher effect of where, you know, where you have the nosy neighbor kind of looking and kind of go, hey, what's going on in the barons? They got a new car. What's going on over there? You get that in an organization. If the leader of the organization then kind of goes, you know what, in the town hall meeting, I want to say, well done to Dove Barron's team. They're starting to educate themselves as a result. They're having better results. They're having better output. And uh, 
we all got to tip our hat to them. Well done, guys. And right. then move on. And people start kind of, you know, twitching the curtain, kind of, what's going on over what's there? Going on? Yeah. Somebody will stop you and kind of go, hey, c- can we do a quick call on MS Teams and Zoom and see what you guys are doing? I'd love to find out more. That's how you create the cascade and the ripple. And people don't, you know, to your point, they're kind of always looking for direction rather than actually being a leader themselves. Yeah, that's that's a great example of it. I, I, but I love the metaphor of the the uh, the curtain twitcher. Um, having grown up where I grew up, I knew many of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's uh she's the curtain twitcher. <laughs> and we're essentially what we called them, right? No um, way. So tie that tie this into uh, the wasp trap because I think that's a fascinating concept uh, that I think people can maybe begin to see themselves in okay so bear with me about the story i'll just give context to the story so it was um a few years ago again with the family we were going to this new uh um, place called center parks there's a series of them throughout europe they're like these chalets you rent in the woods and and the first center parks opened here in in Ireland in about that time. So it was in its infancy. It was full of mistakes, the way any kind of new idea does. Sure. So we were pulling in. There was a big backlog of people pulling. The way you check in is you drive up to this chalet and you check in, and then they point you to your room, to your 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 own private chalet. And when we were waiting, it was a warm day. My kids had the back windows. Then next thing I hear this commotion and i turn around and my son's waving his arms all over the place i'm like what the heck's going on discovered that was a wasp and he was attacking the boys because they were eating an ice cream sure so the commotion subsides i turn around and i kind of go everybody okay wind up the windows and the place was covered in wasps because it hadn't got used to itself yet the place the place was still settling down right so my my son goes, hey dad, why does that always happen at the end of the end of the summer? And I was like, on a good question, I have no idea. Let's make that part of our project at this uh, for the week on the holidays. Right. So we look it up, Dov. I did a bit of work, find out that the life cycle of the wasp reveals why this happens. So very very quickly, when a queen wasp comes out of hibernation, she's already pregnant right? So she's been impregnated. She's gone. Several wasps go. It's a great analogy for innovation. Several female wasps go, queen bees go off, or queen wasps go off, and they hide in different places. And then they emerge when the weather conditions are right. Mm -hmm. They don't all make it. Their very first thing to do is go and build a nest. But they can't eat and I'll tell you a little bit about that more because it's fascinating. They don't eat. And that's why they have these really thin waists. They've evolved in a way that they don't eat. So the very first wasp licks bees. And you'll see sometimes bees on the ground before they've metabolized. And the wasp licks the bee because the bee has sugars on its side. So it uses that sugar as fuel, fuels itself up, goes off, starts to build a nest, then lays its eggs. And all the worker wasps are female. They too cannot eat. So how the heck do they get food? How do they survive? This is what happens. So they go out into nature, they pick up uh, insects like ants, they chew them up, and they feed them to the larvae. The larvae in turn return this sugary spit, they turn the insects into this sugary spit, and the other sister wasps lick the spit and that metal that gives them fuel and they go back out again so this cycle happens for a long period of time the original queen releases a pheromone because that's how they communicate a smell into the atmosphere to communicate the period of time and life cycle of the nest of the colony that this is happening but then around late summer she stops emitting that pheromone and that signals that it's time to stop laying eggs. At this time, then some new queens are impregnated and they go out to start the cycle again. So what happens to all those wasps, the worker wasps who have been working all the time, they go out and they find 
they go and get their insects, bring it back. There's no more larvae, so they have no more food. So they start to get angry, and they go out into nature looking for I look for ways your kids' ice cream. <laughs> yeah. So they target bins, they target picnics, they target kids with lollipops and ice cream. But interestingly, one of the ways they find this sugar is in rotten fruit. Mm. And for those people who know cider, it's pretty much rotten fruit fermented. Mm. And they become kind of drunk and angry, and they started to attack and go crazy. And the reason that I say it's the wasp trap is not just because of the story of the wasp, because what wasp stands for is an acronym for wanderingly, wandering aimlessly sans purpose. And sans means without, without. in French. So wandering, wandering aimlessly without purpose. Or as I say in the book, you're like an octopus on rollerblades, lots of movement, but no direction. Mm -hmm. So the wasp, the queen wasp, in a way, acts as this kind of CEO or leader, mm -hmm. where she directs everybody and she orchestrates the whole hive, which is the organization. But without that, you have lots and lots of busy people, but they're not going in the same direction. They're not going. And you, as you know, Dove, we've talked about this before. People are energy. And if you yes. can harness people's energy and have a collective, it's an exponential difference in an organization. It's not just one plus one is two. It's massive difference. And mm -hmm. if you can get them all focused in the same place with the collective direction, storytelling, dipping into purpose, you can get magical results from people. And that goes for us on an individual level as well. There's no point in being busy. It's like, what are you busy doing? What are you trying to achieve? And people kind of go, oh, I just want to enjoy life. And go, you will enjoy it more if you're aiming for something. Mm -hmm. Because most people go through life aimless. Mm -hmm. And if you're aiming for nothing, you're going to get there. So the question becomes, as you are listening to watching this, um, have you been a queen wasp directing people? Are you a worker wasp? And maybe you see yourself as that. Um, and because you're working in an organization that is not giving you the direction, maybe you, maybe that's where your anger is coming from and your frustration is coming from and you're attacking from. And maybe it's time for you to be, metaphorically speaking, of course, but for you to be your own queen and for you to be the queen of your organization or of your group of your uh, 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 department or whatever it might be. And, you know, and, and let's take this further, because, again, the uh, subtitle of Aiden's book is a mindset of permanent reinvention for individuals, organizations, and life. So if you know what your purpose is, the truth of the matter is it doesn't matter what life is going to throw at you. You're always on that purpose, and you will reinvent yourself in line with that purpose. I'll just, as we come towards the end of the show, I'll just say something here that I, that I, that is a very important part of my work. And I say to people, "What do I do?" And people have a difficulty explaining. But I understand, right? And I say, "Well, let me just let me give you a way of understanding it." And they go, "Okay." I said, "Let's imagine we have a totalitarian government." It may, be on, it may be on the horizon, but let's say we're living in a totalitarian government world uh, who says suddenly, Dove, you're not allowed to speak. What am I going to do? And they go, well, I guess you do your podcast. Okay, so they ban that. Well, I guess I write books. No, no, they ban that. Well, I'll do one on one. No, you, that's banned. What do I do? And they go, I don't know. And they go, okay, so the totalitarian government tells me I got to go work at McDonald's and I got to flip burgers. What do I do? And they go, you flip burgers really well? I go, yeah, maybe. But that's not what I do. And they go, well, I don't understand. What do you do? I said, I do exactly what I do now. Only I do it while flipping burgers. Because my intent, my purpose is exactly the same. So I can reinvent myself into any particular role. It doesn't matter because the fuel is my purpose. 
and I get to decide that. And as you get to decide that, you can reinvent yourself in the way that Aiden's talking about. And again, I recommend that you pick this book up and start reading it and really examine that because you can reinvent yourself it, because you're not reinventing the essence of who you are. You're not reinventing the substance you are. You're discovering that in order to reinvent the external way it's played out. And that, for me, is the essence of what this book is about. It's the essence of what Aiden's message has been about. As we come to the end of this, uh, Aiden, I'd like for you to give us one practical tip that you want everybody to walk away with. And then please tell us where everybody can find out more about you, your books, and your podcast, etc. So I think the, the most important thing is, and th this is often not spoken about dove on part one we just spoke about this where you asked me you know what what was the pain in there that caused you to go on this journey there's a, a chapter in the book that i i call kintsugi thinking and kintsugi is this japanese art where the where the ceramics or pottery where when it's broken it's repaired but instead of trying to disguise the cracks you celebrate them so they use this golden lacquer mm -hmm. and kintsugi just means golden joinery. And I, I stumbled upon this great quote by Leonard Cohen, there's a crack in everything, that's where the light gets in. Mm -hmm. And I went, that's a beautiful idea for, well, innovation needs an acceptance of failure. Because mm -hmm. as I mentioned, in part one, 93% of businesses start off pointed somewhere, but end up in a totally different direction. To be able to do that means an acceptance of the failure that's symbiotic with success. You fail your way towards success. Everything you start off in the early days will fail and stumble. Think of a child walking, they'll, they'll fall, 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 except you don't kind of go, hey, come on, Dove, try harder. <laughs> Instead, you kind of go, well done, you did really well, you tried again, and you encourage. And I think that we need to be cognizant of that on a personal level and be compassionate to ourselves. Because when you try things, they're not all going to work out. But again, if you have purpose, and you are driven to live life and milk whatever you can out of life, you will accept all the failures as part of your successes, and enjoy life much more understanding that the trough and the quay wave work in unison, they're all part of the same body of water. Beautiful. And fi finally, you can find me on LinkedIn, you can find me on the innovation show.io. And you can find the book on Amazon. Wonderful. And again, we'll make sure that we post all of those links in the show notes. Again, thank you, Aiden. It was a pleasure and honor having you here. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for all that you've shared. I hope you'll stay with us to the end. And for you, dear listener, remember that you can uh, listen to past shows, you can go all the way back. And uh, there's so many shows for you to uh, really take in. But before you do any of that, I encourage you to go back and listen to this show more than once. I know you're probably on a treadmill or you're doing something passively. And, and there's probably a ton of great stuff you missed. If you didn't catch part one, go back and listen to part one. But take some notes. Listen, information is worth the hole in the donut. You've listened to 10,000 podcasts. Information is worth the whole in the donut. Transformation comes from the application of what it is you're learning. Take notes. Take it in. Think about how can I use this? What can I do this? Because you need to become undisruptible. Thank you to Aidan McCullen. And for you, dear listener, remember, those who control the meaning for the tribe also control the movement of the tribe business and political leaders committed to positively shaping the political and business landscape know they must tap into what drives human behavior. I'm Dov Barron. I show businesses, teams, and leaders how to harness their emotional source code to move their tribe because unified actualized meaning is the one single monolithic difference between mediocrity and greatness in individuals and in organizations. I want to thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. Till next time, stay curious, my friends, stay curious about your need for constant reinvention, but to do so while being completely undisruptible. I'm Dove Barron. I'm here to assist you tapping into your deepest meaning to reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit 
in your business, your life, and the leadership impact. And I am out.